You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more so huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History is about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hello, one and all. Thanks for joining us at In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, Episode 16. We are coming to you this week from the Free Love Studios, located somewhere outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Expertly handling the controls is our indomitable executive producer, Lulu Spencer. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook and Twitter, where my handle is, In the Past Lane. And we hope you'll subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes or Stitcher. And if you do, please take a moment to rate this podcast and leave a review. It really helps. Thanks. Well, people, last week, In the Past Lane brought you, just in time for the GOP National Convention in Cleveland, a full episode on the history of the Republican Party. This week, with the Democrats gathering in Philadelphia for their national convention, we bring you an episode on the history of women who have sought the presidency long before Hillary Clinton. So here's the lineup. First, I bring you a short segment on a curious voting controversy that few people have ever heard of. Next, I speak with historian Ellen Fitzpatrick about her new book, The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency. Finally, we take up this curious question. Has the United States already had a woman president? Hmm... I wonder what he means by that. Okay, people. Keep ignoring that check engine light because your journey in the past lane begins now. It's November 5th, Election Day in Rochester, New York. Susan and several friends head downtown to vote. At the polling site, Susan is asked a few perfunctory questions by a clerk. Are you a citizen? Do you reside in this district? Has anyone tried to bribe you today? Satisfied with her answers, the clerk allows Susan to deposit her ballot. Just an ordinary scene in the life of American democracy, right? Wrong. This was November 5th, 1872, nearly 50 years before women won the right to vote. Susan, or let me be more precise, Susan B. Anthony, the famous women's rights activist, and her friends had knowingly and intentionally broken the law by casting ballots that day. Twelve days later, a federal marshal knocked on the door of Anthony's home and placed her under arrest. Susan B. Anthony was thrilled. This was precisely what she had hoped would happen. She and her fellow women's rights activists were eager to bring a test case before the courts that would challenge the denial of voting rights for women. They would argue that the recently ratified 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution defined citizenship and voting rights in such a way that they guaranteed women the right to vote. To make the most of this incident, Susan B. Anthony went on a speaking tour in the surrounding region of upstate New York, delivering a lecture in dozens of towns titled, Is It a Crime for a U.S. Citizen to Vote? The text of this speech was reprinted in countless newspapers across the country. In the end, however, Susan B. Anthony was found guilty of illegally voting and hit with a fine. Even then, she used the occasion of her sentencing to deliver one of her most famous speeches, a passionate demand for women's voting rights. This is what she said in part. Friends and fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight under indictment for the alleged crime of having voted at the last presidential election. The preamble of the federal constitution says, We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, 
nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people, who formed the union. And it is a downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of securing them provided by this democratic Republican government, the ballot. Susan B. Anthony's radical actions gained a lot of attention for the women's suffrage cause, but it would be decades before the law began to change. Now, there's one more important element to this story worth noting. Susan B. Anthony was not the only woman taking radical action in 1872 in the name of women's rights. That same year, Victoria Woodhull was the Equal Rights Party candidate for President of the United States. But on Election Day, while Susan B. Anthony and her friends were casting their ballots, Victoria Woodhull languished in prison. We will learn how she ended up there in our next segment, when I speak with historian Ellen Fitzpatrick about her fascinating new book, The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency. In this book, Fitzpatrick profiles three women who sought the White House. The first is Victoria Woodhull. The second is the senator from Maine, Margaret Chase Smith, who ran for president in 1964. And the third is Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, who ran in 1972. And yes, Fitzpatrick also talks about the political career of Hillary Clinton and her place in history. We'll be right back with these fascinating stories. Okay, we're back. With me now is Ellen Fitzpatrick. Ellen is a professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. She specializes in modern American political and intellectual history. Fitzpatrick is the author of many books, including Letters to Jackie, Condolences from a Grieving Nation, and the book we are eager to discuss with her today, The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency, out now from Harvard University Press. Ellen Fitzpatrick, welcome to In the Past Lane. Happy to be here. Thank you. You've written a very interesting book, which is exceedingly well-timed. My first question to you is, what prompted you to write this book? Well, it kind of occurred to me that as I was thinking about a new book project and what I might like to spend my time on, that there had been very little attention given to women who have run for the presidency. They seem to have sort of fallen between two fields. One, the field of American women's history, where the accent has been less on presidential history for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the field of presidential history. And obviously, Women didn't show up very much there either. So it seemed to me that it was worth trying to historicize in some way what I thought at the time was likely to be a race in 2016 in which there might be some women presidential candidates. I didn't know when I decided to write the book whether Hillary Clinton or Carly Fiorino or anybody else would be, Jill Stein would be in the mix, but it seemed an interesting area that really hadn't been explored as thoroughly as it might be. Yeah, the time seems seems right. And I think for a lot of people, it's, it's a surprising story to know that there have been certainly lots of names put forward. I think a statistic you cite is 200 women have had their name put forward or have received a vote or have tried for the presidency. But of them, about 14 have formally run for the presidency, either for major parties or for smaller parties. I think a lot of people are surprised by how far back that history goes. Yes, that was surprising to me as well. And the interesting stories that go with it. Your book, you're not going to talk about all 14 people. You, You focus on three people, three women who are very interesting. Victoria Woodhull, Margaret Chase Smith, and Shirley Chisholm. And what's wonderful about them as as a focus of your work is that they're very different women. And they're each sort of situated in a different time period and each also bring with them certain kinds of, or raise certain kinds of questions. I mean, some of the opposition to them is pretty straightforward and not all that different in either era, but then each of them being in a different era produces different kinds of opposition. So maybe we could start with Victoria Woodhull. Tell us about her. She's a remarkably interesting figure in late 19th century American history. She certainly is. And what was fascinating to me was to see this bid for the presidency emerge during Reconstruction. And essentially, of course, we know that there was a lively debate during Reconstruction in the Congress about the parameters of the 14th and 15th Amendment that 
ultimately conferred citizenship on African Americans and also voting rights on African American men. And what happened, uh, of course, was that the women's suffrage movement thought that this would be an opportune moment to try to press their case for votes for women. Of course, the upshot of it was that they were not included under the 14th or the 15th Amendment. And the effort really went on the part of Stanton and Anthony to try to advance a 16th Amendment that would enfranchise women. Along comes Victoria Woodhull, who at that point had become very wealthy. She and her sister were the first women to open a brokerage firm on Wall Street. And she became interested in the women's suffrage issue. And she took a different approach and came up with the idea, with some assistance, no doubt, that women, she argued, had already been enfranchised under the terms of the 14th and 15th Amendments. And she wanted to try to persuade Congress to issue a declaratory act saying so. And in making this case, she became the first woman to testify before a congressional committee. Yeah. And so she's, in some ways, using her, what ultimately becomes her candidacy to, I don't think, harboring any visions of actually winning, but really trying to advance the cause for suffrage and for a wide range of rights for women way back in 1870, when she announces, and in 1872, when the contest begins. Yes, she really was, in some ways, quite a modern candidate because she announces two years before the election. And that, of course, was not common in the 19th century. And she really is very much advancing. Initially, she was, it was a sort of kick-sock campaign in which she saw this as a, as a way of calling attention to the issue of women's equality. But it morphed into something different, and that was based on an insight that she had. She used the example of Lincoln, really, and she said that it might be possible for Americans to more easily rally around a candidate, a person who personified a cause, rather than the cause itself. And so she saw herself as embodying this principle, really, of women's equality and thought, you know, we might not be able to persuade everyone philosophically on this point, but perhaps if they could see a presidential candidate who stood behind this issue and who themselves demonstrated the worth, really, of a woman in national public life and potentially as a leader of the country, that they might be able to find their way towards that. And so that became increasingly her purpose in running. And she also founds a, a weekly, is it a newspaper or a journal? Uh, yes, yeah, she to, did. <laughs> to, so she's way ahead and she's very 20th, 20th century in many ways. She realizes the media is probably going to give her nothing, no attention or mostly negative or, or scoffing attention. So she founds her own newspaper and uses that as her main organ for putting out the information of, and ideas about her candidacy. She did. And there again, you know, the newspapers in the late 19th century were almost all, frankly, partisan. They were aligned with one political party or another. And she knew that she couldn't get a major political party behind her. So she establishes her own political party to advance her candidacy, the Equal Rights Party, and then uses her vast fortune to set up her own newspaper. She claimed that this the Woodhull and Claflin Weekly was nonpartisan. But in fact, she said, you know, it's completely nonpartisan except for the fact that it advances Victoria Woodhull <laughs> as a presidential candidate. So right. in all other ways, nonpartisan. Right. Even has, so, her, even has her name in the title. Yes, exactly. And it's a really a fascinating read to look at the issues of this newspaper. Hmm. So she she announces her candidacy. And I think in her announcement even says, kind of you know, tongue-in-cheek or, or humorously, she says, I anticipate criticism. Yes. She, she, she does get criticism right out of the gate. And then eventually, really full-blown scandal when people start digging into her, her lifestyle, if, I guess we'd call it today, and in her associations with what at the time was considered very scandalous, the free love movement. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how she drew that kind of criticism. 
Well, the fascinating thing about the free love element of this is Victoria Woodhull historically has been very much associated with that, and that's really, you know, how she is best known in history as a kind of a radical feminist who supported free love. But she only found her way to that cause after she was brought down as a presidential candidate in the midst of this campaign she was waging and a scandal that erupted mostly rooted in her family. And it went like this. She had been married at 15. She was married off by her parents to a doctor who had been called in to treat her for a fever. They were kind of a hard scrabble lot. Her father was a grifter. Her mother had serious mental problems. And so she married this doctor who turned out to be an opium addict and, you know, a notorious womanizer. She's quite young, isn't she quite young? Yeah, she she was only 15 when she married. And at 16, she had her first child in a really traumatic labor and delivery that was presided over by her drunken physician husband. She did have a second child with him, and then she left him. And she was divorced, and she met a Civil War veteran named Colonel Blood. There's a kind of Dickensian quality to the characters Mm -hmm. in the Woodhull story. And they went off to New York and were married, and uh, he left his wife for her. And when she was running for president, her mother went down to the local police station and claimed that Colonel Blood was trying to kill her, the mother. She was paranoid and there was nothing to it. But the police began to investigate. And in the course of that, it came to light that Victoria Woodhull and Colonel Blood had taken in Canning Woodhull, who was now really dying of his opium addiction. And she later said that it was something that she had done that she was, it was among the the things in her life that she was most proud, that she had shown compassion to this man who had treated her really so poorly. But when it came to light that Victoria Woodhull was living with her current husband and her former husband, that was too much in Victorian America. And it became front page news and it really sunk her presidential ambitions. It won't surprise you to know that she didn't take the sitting down and instead lashed out in the pages of her weekly against the most prominent Protestant minister of her time, Henry Ward Beecher, who she accused of having an affair with a parishioner. And that led to the infamous Beecher-Tilton scandal, Mm -hmm. but it also led to Victoria Woodhull being prosecuted under the Comstock Act for circulating obscene material in the mail, and the obscene material were the stories in her newspaper in which she recounted Beecher's acts. And believe me, by the standards of today, there was nothing very salacious about those articles, but nonetheless. And so on Election Day in 1872, Victoria Woodhull was in prison. Right. So she went up against the powers that be. And even though we now know historically Beecher, there's a lot of evidence that said he was indeed having this affair. She, in exposing it, really, the powers that be really came down hard on her, and she ended up in jail on election night. Yeah, and she, you know, her advocacy of free love only came out in the midst of all of that. You know, when she, in really defending herself against the double sexual scandal, said, you know, in all this salacious talk about her private life, she said, yes, I believe in free love. And what she meant was that Women should be able to have a relationship, romantic sexual relationship in marriage really was, I think, her original conception of this. And then to be able to end that marriage and to go on and marry someone else if they chose to. And so it was really a challenge to the notion of, you know, you're in a marriage for good no matter what and whether you're happy or unhappy. And she rejected that view. And of course, became very controversial, but that led to a whole speaking career around that particular issue. Yeah. And of course, today we look at those views as pretty mainstream views when it comes to the independence of people and making choices about marriage. Well, she certainly is a colorful character. The next woman that you profile another 70 or so years later is Margaret Chase Smith. And she's a very different kind of individual in a very different era 
particularly focusing on the Cold War. So tell us about Margaret Chase Smith. She was a really very impressive woman. I, I must say that when I began my research on her, I knew a little bit about her and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't expecting to find what I did find about her. And she had a really fascinating career. I remembered her actually from growing up in New England. She was a senator from Maine and a Republican in Pearls. And it turned out that she had a really remarkable political career. She came into office in 1940 really through the death of her husband under what we call the widow's mandate. This was the most common route for women at that point into national political life. They would sometimes be appointed or elected to fill out the term of a deceased male relative, usually husband. And so her husband, who was a congressman from Maine, as he was on his deathbed, issued a press release or someone issued it for him, urging his, he was up for re-election, urging that if he were to die, that his constituents vote for his wife, who had been running his congressional office and very involved in his career. And so she was elected to fill out his term in a special election, and then she went on to stand for the seat against really the wishes of the Republican Party. These widows were supposed to be placeholders until, you know, the assumption was that they would have no ambition until an appropriate man could be found to run. And instead, she challenged in the primary other Republicans, and she was selected, and she went on to be elected to the United States Senate and remained in the Senate until 1972. And then, of course, in 64, she did run for president in a brief and quite unsuccessful campaign. Yeah, she was a maverick in a lot of ways. She was the first woman uh, in the Senate. In fact, I think you recount the fact that through much of her Senate career, there was no women's bathroom. So she had to use the public restroom (laughs) outside of the Senate. And But interestingly, she resisted the idea. It really kind of rebuffed any questions when people asked her about her her gender and her her politics, you know, was she a feminist? She really disliked she den- that. Yeah, she, she denied being a feminist, but what's interesting about about her is that she was actually quite attentive to women's issues. She was among, repeatedly among those in the Congress who introduced and sponsored the Equal Rights Amendment. In her early congressional career, she was very interested in the situation of women's employment during the Second World War. So she had a pretty strong record in that regard. She was the first woman elected on her own to the Senate, and that was a very remarkable achievement. And she was greatly admired. What I found fascinating about her was that when she announced that she was going to run for president in 1964, This woman who was every year among the most admired women in the country in the Gallup poll suddenly is being portrayed in the newspapers as somehow bereft of her senses that she could imagine that she would be an appropriate candidate for president. In fact, the response to Victoria Woodhull in 1870, it seemed to me, was more welcoming and the newspapers were quite intrigued by her. There was some ridicule, but there was also there were also people saying, hey, you know, we live in unexpected times, and who would imagine this? In 1964, almost a century later, the sexism in response to Margaret Chase Smith was really, really striking. Yeah, people often commented on her appearance, and also, I mean, I think it's it's an interesting, in some ways, a classic expression of Cold War, post-World War II values. The return to the home for women after World War II and the real emphasis on the nuclear family. And she, I think she bore the brunt of some of that. Yes. And you, you certainly saw some of that and you saw just some, you know, sort of rank sexism. A lot was made of her age, which she really took umbrage at. She was 67. And you know, she went from one day before she was a candidate being described as, you know, sort of youthful looking, athletic. The next day, you know, silver haired, older, right. <laughs> menopausal. You know, the whole tone of the coverage really shifted dramatically. So she announces her run in 64, 
And she actually stands for election in a couple of primaries and actually gets 30% of the vote in the state of Illinois, finishes second to Goldwater. So it's unlikely that she's going to receive the nomination, but she's taken seriously, at least by some voters. And she shows up at the convention and receives a number of first ballot votes at the convention. So you do see at least some progression. You do. She was, I think, the first woman to have her name placed in nomination by a major political party. And she was determined to see that happen. And the thing about Margaret Chase Smith is that she had developed a kind of style as a politician that worked incredibly well in Maine. She really accented the personal. She got out there. She kept in close touch with her constituents. She went door to door when she was campaigning for reelection. She showed up at all kinds of small meetings and you know, press the flash and really she knew her constituents very well. She refused to take campaign contributions and she would send back even a dollar bill with a polite note thanking the person sending it in and saying, I don't accept campaign contributions. But she's running in 64 at a moment when we're really seeing major changes in the nature of presidential campaigns, and particularly with the influence of television and mass media. And it was simply impossible to bring to a national level the style that had been successful in Maine and also be competitive. And so she really tried to run this campaign without spending any money. And so she didn't compete in many primaries, and she really had trouble mounting any kind of operation. Although, yes, she did do okay in in Illinois, and she took it all the way to the convention. It's quite fascinating to think about a candidate giving, refusing to take campaign contributions and actually sending money back is a very, very different, very different era. The other thing about Margaret Chase Smith is she was considered quite a Cold War hawk. She was, yeah. And I see an interesting parallel, potentially anyway. I want to talk about Hillary Clinton at some point, but you hear some people make the argument that women candidates as they ascent to higher levels, particularly on the federal level, need to project this kind of hawkishness and toughness as a way to be taken seriously. And that certainly seems to be the case with her, but I mean, it was also the Cold War. This also may have been passionately held ideals. Yeah, and I don't think her position was really all that unlike others in her political party. She was a moderate on social issues and She backed a number of LBJ's Great Society initiatives. She and LBJ were quite close, liked each other, but she was very hawkish on foreign policy. And one of the things that you see in her career that you're touching upon here is an effort to distance, I think, herself from many of the women in public life in the early part of the 20th century had been aligned with the peace movement. So Mm -hmm. you think of somebody like Jeanette Rankin who voted against both the American entry into both the First and the Second World War. And that kind of association between women and pacifism was, I think, in the eyes of women who were ambitious for higher office, a non-starter. The difficult thing about the American presidency, or the way that it became difficult for women, was that it combines not only the role of the national leader, but with the role of commander-in-chief. And so in the nuclear age, the doubts were always raised about whether women were sufficiently warlike in their character and their leanings to really be entrusted with leading the nation into war and really understanding and appreciating the national security issues and could they push the button? This is what Geraldine Ferraro was asked when she was running as Mondale's running mate and she challenged the reporter who asked her that question and said, I don't think you'd be asking me that question if I wasn't a woman. So those doubts were there. And to some extent, I think Margaret Chase Smith was really trying to do what she could for her state in Maine, which got a lot of military dollars for the Bath Ironworks, also for military installations there. So, you know, some of this was rail politique and some of it was ideology. And I have no doubt that she sincerely believed what she believed. But it was a source of frustration to President Kennedy, for example, because she voted against the nuclear test ban treaty. Okay, 
it's time for a short break. When we return, my conversation with Ellen Fitzpatrick takes up the path-breaking presidential bid of Shirley Chisholm in 1972. Don't go anywhere, people. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Okay, we're back. Let's move on to number three, Shirley Chisholm. She comes into politics just as Margaret J. Smith's career is coming to an end. She gets elected in 1968. She's from Brooklyn. So tell us about her rapid ascent and her presidential campaign. Well, Shirley Chisholm had a tremendous amount of grit. Her life story is an inspiring one. And she had grown up in Brooklyn and her parents had really struggled during the Depression. They had three daughters and they sent Shirley and her sister to live with her maternal grandmother in the West Indies because they felt that they could have a better life there. That's where she was educated and British style schools. And she was a very good student. She came back to New York and wound up going to Brooklyn College. And while she was there, She began to attend the local meetings of the Democratic Club in her district, and this was an Irish-dominated political machine, and she was appalled by what she saw, African-Americans who would come to these meetings in which the political boss, you know, would oversee them and see, you know, what are the complaints of the constituents, and African-Americans would be sitting on one side of the room and they'd be, you know, they had serious concerns in the neighborhoods about policing, about jobs, about any number of matters. And, you know, she was appalled at the way that they were treated and the way in which power rested entirely in the hands of these machine politicians. So she gets involved in Brooklyn politics and eventually She and other African-American insurgents managed to overthrow that Irish-dominated machine, and she eventually gets elected to the New York State Assembly. And then in 1968, she ran for Congress and actually ran against James Farmer. And she was elected, and that launched her career. And then, of course, in 72, she launches this presidential campaign. She's not only a woman running for president, but she's an African-American woman running for president in the era of civil rights and all of that. So her situation is even more precarious and the kind of criticisms and kind of public reaction is going to be, there's many, many more ways to criticize Shirley Chisholm. So what happens in this election? For example, how is she treated or what kind of support does she get within the Democratic Party? And at this point, there is a full-blown women's rights movement. Are they on board with her? You know, that's a fascinating part of Shirley's story because, which she tells actually quite well herself in her memoirs, what disappointed her was that when she went for sort of the top prize and ran for the Democratic nomination, participated in some primaries, she found that she did not get the unified support that she would have hoped to have gotten from some white feminist leaders or from. African-American political activists with whom she had had a long and, she thought, cordial relationship. So she talked at some length about the way in which both her race and her gender were liabilities. She actually said that she had experienced more discrimination in American politics as a woman than she had as an African-American. But obviously, these things could not be disaggregated. But it was really, to her, shocking that somebody like Bella Abzug, who was a really outspoken feminist member of Congress from New York, 
who insisted on standing on the dais with Shirley when she announced she was running for president, refused to ever endorse her. And, you know, she didn't have a whole lot of patience for that. And likewise, from other African-American politicians who said, you know, we're frank to say to her that we really think a man should be the first African-American president, not a woman. So she didn't take that sitting down any more than Victoria Woodall Mm. (laughs) took the criticisms of her sitting down. These were not your average women. And she was very feisty in response to all of that. You could give her stump speech today and it would be entirely relevant. She was a very, very direct critic of American military intervention. She was very concerned about income inequality, about health care, about improving the infrastructure, of finding jobs, of enforcing existing anti-discrimination laws. This was really the platform upon which she ran. And really trying to bring in young and previously disenfranchised or alienated voters, too. Because when she runs in 72, it's only seven years since the Voting Rights Act. And so she, I think she sees, exactly. herself, she sees herself as, in some ways, advancing the broader cause of the Democratic Party that, to pull in these new constituents. And it's also the first time that 18-year-olds are going to be allowed to vote. And so she's trying to put together a coalition of African-Americans, of Latinos, of women, of college students, and of the disaffected people who were being left behind and, you know, who were struggling in this very wealthy nation. And in some ways, she would remind you of the Sanders campaign this year in her appeal to college students. She also self-financed largely her campaign. And that was a hurdle that all these women had. They just couldn't get the financing to really mount an aggressive national campaign. Nobody thought they had a chance, so neither the political parties nor their big donors were willing to invest in them. And even with very little money and no institutional support, she still does get 150-something delegates, and that, when come convention time, I think that earns her, does it not, a main speaking opportunity? It did, and she actually received the most votes of a female presidential candidate before Hillary Clinton in 2008. She came to the convention with the most delegates of any woman presidential candidate prior to Secretary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a perfect segue to Madam Secretary Clinton, uh, (laughs) because you focus on these three women in history, but the epilogue to your book focuses a lot on the emerging story of Hillary Clinton as a presidential candidate really does a fine job of describing her political life and the various chapters and how she's how she has come to this point in her career where she's likely to be the first woman to receive the nomination from a major political party. So what kind of impact do you think Hillary Clinton is, has had and is likely to have as time moves forward? Well, one of the fascinating things about her situation, Ed, is that she, I think that she has been greatly underestimated during this presidential primary as a candidate. You know, there's been a lot of talk. She faced a pretty stiff opposition within her own party from Sanders for the nomination. And there was a lot of discontent and her unfavorability ratings are high and people are saying she's not likable and so forth. But I think that that narrative misses the ways in which she overcame obstacles that basically derailed every single woman in American history who preceded her. And paradoxically, in 2016, the very barriers that she overcame were then perceived, the fact that she had done so became part of the narrative of what her weaknesses were. For example, she was the first woman to be able to get the money to mount a serious national campaign. And there's been a central narrative about her being tainted because of the speeches that she gave, where she paid a lot of money, the super PACs. She wouldn't be in this game had she not been able to put the financing together. But in 2016, she's being cast as corrupt, a party insider. No political party prior to her, no major political party, would ever have invested these resources in a woman candidate because they didn't think they could win, as I said a moment ago. So The fact that she got 18 million votes in 2008 
which are more votes than any male or female presidential candidate ever amassed in a primary season in all of American history. She showed that she could get votes, and now she's being cast as an establishment figure, part of the old order, a party insider. So there's no failure like success is all I can say if you look at this in the long run. In some ways, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, And one of her greatest strengths is her extraordinary long and varied career. And it also means that she's been in the public eye for a long time. And all of her various uh, positions as senator, as secretary of state, as first lady, all of that has created opportunities for opponents to attack her. But it's also provided her with really an unprecedented resume for a woman seeking the highest office. Not only the resume, but also the public knowledge of her. You know, like her or hate her. I think that part of why Clinton is where she is today, within striking distance of the presidency, is because Americans feel that they know her pretty well. That, of course, does not stop the ongoing search for the bottom. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I think that this long period of knowledge of her and seeing her in action has actually really helped her to get to where she is today. Right. I think a lot of the women who have run, I mean, I knew who Carly Fiorina was, but I don't know how many other people did uh, across America. And you could say the same thing about Patricia Schroeder and many others. So experience does give her tremendous name recognition and familiarity, which puts her in the same company as many of the men that have been running. You know, it's a sine qua non for success in presidential politics. It's very, very hard to acquire that kind of national platform. Ironically, she came to it through her husband, not unlike Margaret Chase Smith. So in that sense, you know, it was through her husband's two terms as president and her service as first lady that we got to know her. But of course, she went on from there and was elected to the Senate on her own and then ran in 2008 and then joined her opponent's administration and became secretary of state. So all of that together, I guess my point simply is to say that it's a remarkable set of achievements that have put her where she is today. This is no accident. And no one else has been able to do it. So whether you vote for her or not, you like her or not, I think you have to recognize historically that it is pretty remarkable. That leads to my final question, which is to sort of widen the lens a little bit. American women enjoy some of the greatest freedoms and opportunities compared to women all around the world. But if we look at our political system, women are incredibly underrepresented. When you yes. look at the Senate and the, and the Congress, both in both cases, about 20% or one in five representatives are women. And if you look at, I mean, there are higher levels of women's participation in parliaments or in Congresses in Cuba, in Finland, South Africa, Germany, many, many other places. And so Do you have a sense of why? What is it in our political culture that has kept us behind other nations in this regard? And do you see this as something that's likely to change quite rapidly? I mean, it's already changing in some regards, but what's your take on that? I do think it's changing. And I think whether it's Hillary Clinton or someone else, once this threshold is crossed, that will make a difference. Part of it is a pipeline issue. Women have only been able to vote in the United States for less than 100 years. And I think that the party system and women's place within it, very much on the margins, has been a big factor. I would also call attention to a point I made earlier about the combined roles of commander-in-chief as well as head of state that the American presidency has involved. And that, I think, has made it difficult for women to overcome the sense that women might not be good candidates, not until... When Margaret Chase Smith ran in 1964, still almost half of the public said no to the question when they were asked, would you vote for a woman if she was nominated by your party and was otherwise qualified in all other respects? So there's been this ongoing prejudice against women. And then in terms of comparing it to other nations, it's also the case that in parliamentary systems, when you're voting for the party, as was the case with Margaret Thatcher. You cast your vote for the conservative party. You're not voting for Thatcher per se, that that has helped women to make inroads in other countries. 
And there are also countries like India where there's a sort of family dynasty that women were able to rise up through. So there are particularities in these other settings that help explain the progress there. Right. And I think if we look in the last 20 years, there's been a, we say there's only 20% of the members of the Senate are women, but it was, you know, 3% not that long ago. So it, things are trending in a, in a more, in a direction towards more parity, more equality. Yes, I think so. Well, Ellen, this is a terrific book and it's come out at, as we said, just the right moment when a woman, the first woman is about to be nominated for president by a major party. So I want to thank you for speaking with me today at In the Pass Lane. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me, Ed. Ellen Fitzpatrick is author of The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency, out now from Harvard University Press. So Victoria Woodhull, Margaret Chase Smith, and Shirley Chisholm made history in their own distinct ways. But none became president. If Hillary Clinton wins the 2016 election in November, she will become the first woman elected president of the United States. But here's a provocative question. Is it possible that the United States has already had a female president? Well, in our next segment, we will delve into the extraordinary story of Edith Wilson, the wife of President Woodrow Wilson. In 1914, she was a largely unknown wealthy widow living in Washington, D.C. But one year later in 1915, she met and married the recently widowed Woodrow Wilson. Four years later, while he was engaged in a big-time political struggle to secure ratification of the Versailles Treaty in Congress, that's the treaty that included U.S. membership in the League of Nations, Wilson suffered a debilitating stroke that left him paralyzed, bedridden, and largely unable to speak. And so, for the last 17 months of his presidency, Wilson's wife, Edith, effectively operated as president. That incredible story is coming up next. Okay, we're back at In the Pass Lane. With me now is William Hazelgrove. He is the author of many best-selling novels, including The Pitcher, My Best Year, and The Bad Author. He also runs a cultural blog, The View from Hemingway's Attic. Hazelgrove also writes works of nonfiction, including Hemingway's Attic, Surviving as a Writer, and the forthcoming book, Madam President, The Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson. This book will be out sometime in the fall of 2016, But William Hazelgrove has kindly agreed to talk with us at In the Past Lane in advance of the publication. William Hazelgrove, welcome to In the Past Lane. Oh, thank you very much. Well, here we are on the eve of the Democratic National Convention, an event that seems ready to make history and that Hillary Clinton is going to be the first woman nominated by a major political party for president of the United States. And if she wins in November, she'll become America's first female president. But there's another woman in history who, to a large degree, essentially operated as president, or at least as co-president, and that's Edith Wilson. And she's the subject of your forthcoming book, Madam President, The Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson. So let's get started. Who was Edith Wilson, and how did she get to the White House? Well, she's a very interesting woman. She was born in Virginia, only had two years of schooling, married a man who owned a jewelry company who died and left her the jewelry company. She had no real experience running a business, but she took it on, turned the the company very profitable. And then she sort of became what we would call today a progressive woman. She bought an electric car, was the first woman to get a license in Washington, and then started to travel. So she's in her 40s, and a uh, widower, Woodrow Wilson, sees her walking down the street, is taken with her. His wife had just died the year before, Ellen Wilson, and a meeting's arranged. One thing leads to another. And a year later, they get married. This is in 1915. And Wilson had, at this point, hardening of the arteries. He had high blood pressure. They didn't have any of the uh, beta blockers or things they have now. So he had always sort of managed it. Well, of course, World War I broke out. And then the peace negotiations in Paris were extremely stressful. And his health degenerated, degenerated. 
And it all came to a head when he came back to try and get the League of Nations ratified. And he was on a whistle-stop tour, which is grueling. You're out in the heat, you're traveling and giving these speeches. And he had a thrombosis, basically a blood clot in his brain and a very, very severe stroke. They returned to Washington, and he seemed to recover a little, and then he sort of had a second stroke where he was severely incapacitated, paralyzed on his left side, couldn't talk, could, very, could think not clearly at all for a very long time, and basically was in his bed. At this point, Edith Wilson now, she's only been married to this guy four years. She has two years of schooling, and the doctors all turn to her and, and the cabinet members the people around Wilson and say, look, you've got to handle the presidency. We have no real fear for this. All we can do is invoke the rest cure, which is basically what they did for people with any kind of heart condition or anything to do with the brain. They'd say, basically, lay down, stay away from life. And they told her, they said, "You you can run the government, just don't bring anything stressful to your husband because he has to recover. So she has her mandate right there. And I talk about in the book, this is really the moment power was given. So then Edith Wilson basically is the president because she now has to make all the decisions Wilson would make. And so everything that flowed up to the president was intercepted by her. And she would redirect it, make decisions, sign legislation. She always was very careful to say he signed it. But again, I went to the papers of Woodrow Wilson where many people around, including his valet, said that she would take the pencil or the pen and either direct his hand or just sign it herself. Right. So, so really what we have is in 1919 to 1921, you have a woman who took over the reins of power, who I contend was the first woman president. Certainly seems that way. So if we could back up a moment. So who did you say specifically, you know, handed the reins or sort of said you have to take over this role? A guy that- named Dr. Durkham, and he was a sort of a neurospecialist at the time, which is very primitive, their understanding the brain. And Durkham, and, this, and I got a lot of this information from Edith's memoir. Durkham basically turned to her and said, you can do this. And she said, she said, shouldn't the vice president know about this? And they said, no. They said it would be bad for the country. I think a lot of people thought, you know, if they could just hide Wilson from the public, he would recover, and then he could come back. And again, when, when you start to read about what happened to him, you realize he'll never come back. For six months, nobody in America saw him, just immediate family. Well, then they realized, well, they should take him out so some people can see him. And so they would they put him in the car, propped him up, put his hat on, had his right side face out because his left side was paralyzed, and drove him around Washington. And people would see this sort of white face going around in this black limousine. But Edith, meanwhile, is running the country. And by the way, while this is going on, okay, here's the irony upon irony. While Edith Wilson is sitting in the White House decoding codes, secret, top secret codes from overseas because she has to finish up World War I, all this, you know, the peace negotiations, the suffragettes are out by the front gate of the White House and chaining themselves to the gate to get the vote. So while this is going on, women don't even have the vote, yet the country's being run by a woman. Right. And didn't she refer to herself as the steward, which uh, is sort of an inter- interesting she- way of, she didn't want to claim that she was doing these things. So she wanted to have sort of a benign title like that. I'm the steward of, of the president and his, his day-to-day affairs. But in fact, she's really acting as his regent, as the, the unofficial president. Yeah, the presidentress, they called her. Mm. Um, yes. In 1939, she wrote her memoir. So she was very careful not to usurp Wilson. And she starts off by saying, well, I was just a steward. I never really acted on anything. But then if you start to read it, you see everything she did act on. Mm. So she was walking this line between being the good wife and then being Edith. Edith was a very, uh, she was an aggressive woman. She was forthright. And so that comes through, even though there's all this sort of magnolia and lace in her writing and very flowery prose and all this stuff. But when you read this thing, you're like, oh, yeah, no, she, she was the president. One of the things that I've, I've read about her role was was to protect the president, really to isolate him, so that she was in some ways the gatekeeper. That A lot of people, as you said, didn't see him for months. And so the usual things that happen in Washington, D.C., where the Speaker of the House comes to the White House to talk to the president and so forth, all of that came to a screeching halt because of her unwillingness to let anybody get near him. Absolutely. She was the gatekeeper. So nobody could see Woodrow Wilson unless Edith 
wanted them to, and mostly nobody did see him. Now remember, everything was conducted by correspondence. There's no email. There's no fax. All these departments would mail each other, okay? So correspondence would come in, things. This was the way the business of the White House was conducted. Well, years later in the National Archives were all these letters found that had been unopened. Basically, what would happen is Eve would get stuff that she couldn't deal with, and she'd throw it in a pile to the side. Because, you know, she's almost like a harried woman running a family who's overwhelmed. And she was overwhelmed. She's trying to keep her husband alive. She's trying to run the country. So she's delegating. She's saying, I'll deal with this. I won't deal with this. So she would scribble on official documents. Oh, the president can't deal with this. Uh, the president says, and that would be it. And he, she sent it back. Also, bills, I think it's 10 days that they aren't acted on by the president, become automatic legislation. A lot of bills became automatic legislation because they were acted on nobody. I mean, simple things like people resigning from the government could not happen because there was nobody to resign to. All right? So, I mean, there's a stasis that sort of set in mm. where nothing was happening, and there was a woman at the door, who would literally intercept people. Now, a lot of people say, well, why didn't Vice President Marshall come in and demand the power? Okay, well, the Constitution calls for succession, okay, of power if a president is unable to fulfill his duties. But it doesn't define what, you know, how sick somebody has to be and what is the definition of being unable to fulfill your duties. So it's this sort of gray line. Well, Marshall, who was not liked by the Wilsons. He was sort of a crass man who had this little quip that he became famous for, what this country really needs is a good five-cent cigar. The Wilsons saw him as very lowbrow. He's from Indiana. He was brought in for regional reasons for the ticket. He finally came to the White House to see Wilson, and Edith met him at the door. Not the door of Wilson's room, but just basically at the White House and said, we'll let you know if we need you. And that was it. If there was a moment of power that was going to be handed off, it would have been there. If Marshall had been a different kind of man and said, hey, I demand to see the president, I demand the power that is rightfully mine, he cannot perform. It, it, it probably wouldn't have happened. But he didn't want to be president. So this allowed this power vacuum to occur that Edith could step into. In a way, what Edith did was she sort of kept the ship afloat. I don't think you could say that the you know, government made, or the United States made a lot of progress in the, in the time Edith reigned, because she was basically doing a sort of fallback position. She even said, some men came to the door and said, Wilson has to act on these things, you know. And she said to him, she said, my priority is not the United States. My priority is the health of my husband. She had doctors tell him, if anything stressful gets to him, it will kill him. So that was her mandate. Her whole thing was keep everything from Wilson. And of course, the League of Nations was in full swing in trying to get that approved. And, of course, Henry Cabot Lodge and the Republicans were just dead set against it. And he just had to step into that fight. Didn't she have some clashes with people and wielded some power oh. in, in that regard, the Secretary of State, and there was also a British embassy official? Yeah. Yes, there was. Basically, uh, a Major Stuart Crawford had kind of implied and written a little ditty on the piano that said, Edith Wilson uh, had paid off this other woman, Mary Peck, who uh, Wilson, nobody can know for sure, but Wilson had some sort of relationship with. So what Crawford said was basically Edith Wilson paid off this woman for silence. Edith found out about it and demanded, and he came over with uh, Ambassador Gray and demanded that he leave the country. And Britain's ambassador said, no, he's with me. And he just said, then I'm going to toss you all out. And then uh, what she did was she ended up freezing them all out. She wouldn't see anybody. She wouldn't let Gray any access to the uh, White House. What he basically did was she, if she deemed somebody not loyal to the president, she cut them out. Colonel House, who was the president's probably closest advisor, once he just moved into the power position, House never saw Wilson again. And he very much resented Edith for that. Same thing with Joseph Tumulty, who was his chief of staff. They called him a secretary then. Again, Edith stepped in between them and kept Tumulty away from the president. And Tumulty wrote on one of these documents that you can see in the papers of Woodrow Wilson, the first lady can go to hell. There are some historians who've come out and put sort of nefarious designs behind Edith's grab for power. I didn't see that. 
I saw a woman who was doing the best she could with a president who everybody was saying, oh, he'll get better, which he didn't, and telling her, you are the linchpin. You can run the government and you can keep your husband alive. And we'll, we'll help you do it as best we can. But she was really on her own. Well, this has been uh, very interesting. And I want to thank you for taking the time to inform us about this really interesting and long forgotten chapter in American history where a woman effectively did run the country way back in the early 20th century. And your book, which comes out in October, is that right? Yes, exactly. In October, October we'll, we'll tell the full story. So we're looking forward to that as well. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could say that Hillary Clinton could possibly be the first elected woman president, but Eve Wilson certainly was the first woman president. Thank you very much, William Hazelgrove. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Well, people, as always, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank you for listening, and I encourage you to weigh in with comments, questions, and suggestions via social media and at our website, inthepastlane.com. At this site, you'll also find a show page for this episode that includes links, essays, images, and further reading suggestions related to all the things we've talked about in this episode. Do you want more information about our guests, correspondents, and other contributors? It's all there at inthepastlane.com. And speaking of social media... If you like this podcast, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. In the Past Lane has been made possible by the hard work and dedication of many people. They include technical advisors Holly Hunt and Jesse Anderson, podcasting consultant Daryl Darnell of Pro Podcast Solutions, photographer John Buckingham, graphic designer Maggie Salucci, website by ERI Design, legal services by Tippa Canoe and Tyler Two, social media by the Pony Express. Risk assessment by Little Bighorn Associates. Growth strategies by 5440 or Fight. And of course, a thousand thank yous to our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Special thanks also to Jay Graham for creating the intro music for this podcast and to the Free Music Archive for providing the rest of the music for this episode. I'm in the Past Lanes host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, who's your favorite president? I don't know. Franklin? Hamilton? Well, um, neither of them were actually president. I hate you. SBI. Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 